Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Rhonda. Have Thank you. Thank you. Have a great meeting. Have a great day. Good morning, John. Good morning, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Sure can, thank you. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Rhonda. Can I do a quick test on my PowerPoint just to share real quick? You sure can. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. This is the clerk. The meeting is now live on the meeting portal and YouTube. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Hi, good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me? I sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great meeting. Thanks, Rhonda. Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Would you like to do a mic check? Good morning, thank you. Thank you, have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Wasserman. I believe you're speaking, but you are muted. There we go. I said, good morning, Rhonda. How are you doing? Wonderful, thanks. Nice to see a smiling face from you this morning. There you go, all for you. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Barbara. Your clerk today is going to be Nancy Guerrero. Nancy, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Nancy.
Good morning, Cindy. Good morning. Good morning, Susan. Supervisors. Good morning, Vice President Ellenberg. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you very much. Have a good day as well. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, just a heads up, you're next in my queue for uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, Supervisor Sumidian. Good morning. Can you hear me loud and clear? I sure can. You have a wonderful meeting today. Thank you for your help. My pleasure. Recording in progress. Excuse me, through the chair, I believe Mr. Wasserman is on mute, and I, there we go. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. I was just asking if we have Supervisor Lee on. He is here. There we go. Morning, Mike. There we are, Supervisor Lee is here, it's 9.30. Let's get this show on the road. We'll turn it over to Nancy for the roll call. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Samidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. I'm here too. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Nice to see all your faces. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, five. I got 25 people on my screen. All right. We're going to go to Pledge of Allegiance. Then Supervisor Chavez is going to lead us in that today. So if you can please stand if you're able. Thank you, Mike. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor. I appreciate that. And we're going to turn to Supervisor Smidian now for the invocation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, I am really very pleased and appreciative that we can welcome uh, the Reverend John Harrison to provide today's invocation. Reverend Harrison is the Director of Spiritual Care for El Camino Health and Hospitals. And um, I, uh, on a somewhat lighter note, uh, I, I am pretty sure even without diligent research that he is the first and only invocator we have been uh, in a position to welcome who holds a degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology. So I uh, only wish uh, Reverend was here so we could uh, take him in in all his splendor. But I, I really, in all seriousness, I'm very uh, appreciate, appreciative of uh, his uh, willingness and ability to join us today. Uh, he received uh, not only that uh, degree from the Fashion Institute of Technology, but also a master's in divinity from Princeton University. Uh, and um, his uh, resume indicates a, a real commitment to lifelong learning. So uh, we're uh, doubly pleased to have him deep roots in our community. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, pastor is ordained uh, and uh, working in both the Palo Alto and East Palo Alto AME Zion Church. He has served as a pastoral associate for Stanford University's Memorial Church 
and chaplain at El Camino's hospital in uh, Mountain View. So really a, um, a deep, deep presence in our community. And I, I should say that as a person of faith whose work spans the worlds of both the physical well-being and spiritual health, Reverend Harrison has really sort of been on the front lines, as you can imagine, of this pandemic uh, over the past year and a half at El Camino. Um, his calming presence and focus on the dignity of uh, each individual brings comfort to those in need of care. Uh, he's the person who will sit close uh, and literally hold your hand uh, when you need someone to do that and to be there. So um, I think our community has needed a lot of that over the last year and a half. We are fortunate that Reverend uh, Harrison has been here to help us in that way, and we are fortunate to have him here with us this morning for today's invocation. Reverend, welcome and thank you again. Uh, bless you and thank you, sir. Let us pray. Beloved God, bless the members of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and guide their deliberations that they may govern with wisdom, justice, grace, and compassion, bringing honor to your name and your blessing to humankind. Oh God, we now ask for your supernatural wisdom as the board considers weighty, tough decisions in this session. Help them to carefully consider the relevant information that has been gathered. May those sharing information provide pertinent points clearly understandable to all. Help them to be innovative as they brainstorm situations and solutions. Help them to wisely evaluate their options, considering both the pros and the cons. And then help them to be unified in making the best decisions and to effectively carry them out. Oh God, we know that you're able and we thank you for being willing. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, very much, Reverend. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues for um, welcoming uh, the Reverend to our meeting this morning. And thank you, Reverend, again for those words. Nice Back to you, Mr. Chair. You betcha, nice to start off the day with a bow tie. Thank you, Reverend. We'll now move on to item four, which is announcing adjournments in memoriam. I'm listed as first, so I'm gonna announce in a memory of Marilyn Libers, Liber, excuse me. A dear friend and member of the community, Margaret passed away July 30th, 2021 in the presence of family and friends. In 1960, Burl and Margaret Leibert moved to the property currently known as Coyote Ranch. In 1974, that property became County Park property and a partnership was formed. Since that time, the Leibert family has operated the site for public events and, excuse me, for public events and special occasions that has served this community well. Since the passing of her husband, Verl, in 2002, Margaret has operated the ranch, along with her daughter, Michelle, and family, a multitude of volunteers and friends. The ranch has continued to provide a place to go, to find enjoyment, and feel welcome. And that's certainly true. For more than 60 years, Margaret was a fixture at Coyote Ranch. At 93 years of age, she could still be seen pruning her ro roses and raising a golf cart around the property. She always made a visitor feel welcome and could mesmerize you with the history of the ranch property and surrounding area of San Jose. If you have ever been to Coyote Ranch, you have probably met Margaret and know what I'm talking about. Margaret will be missed. She was a loved one and dear friend to many. On behalf of the County of Santa Clara, I extend to Margaret's family and friends our sincere condolences. Thank you. Next, we move on to Supervisor Chavez for her adjournment. Thank you, Mike. Um, today, I'm asking my colleagues to also adjourn this meeting in memory of Lori Valerie Palomo, a lifelong resident of San Jose. She passed away peacefully in her sleep on May 16th, 2021 at the age of 59 after a short courageous battle against cancer. I want to acknowledge and welcome her husband, John Palomo, who joins us in honor of her memory. 
Lori was born in San Jose on April 10th, 1962 to Steve and Virginia Montoya. She loved her profession and she worked tirelessly at it for over 30 years. She was dedicated to helping people and never had an off button when it came to mentoring or counseling someone in need. Lori was a teacher, an advocate, a born leader who not only touched the lives of so many, but truly helped them find their way. Drawing on her 30 year personal recovery journey, Lori dedicated herself to helping those who struggled with addiction. She worked tirelessly to achieve her credentials in forensic domestic violence, and then ultimately worked as a clinical director in the private sector. Over the past 10 years, we were lucky that she worked for the county as a drug and alcohol rehabilitation counselor and as a jail diversion behavioral health uh, subcommittees commissioner. An activist in the jail system, Lori helped establish a support group for women with incarcerated children. She was passionate about giving people hope without making them feel judged, always telling them the truth, even if it wasn't what they wanted them, if, even if it was what, wasn't what they wanted to hear. Lori was strong, determined, fiercely independent, selfless, kind, and loving. She was a major presence in everybody's life that she loved. Lori, uh, Lori's um, family was her world. Her unconditional love extended far beyond her blood relatives, and she welcomed everyone with an open door. Her energy was unparalleled, unparalleled and she had a quick wit. Lori was the ultimate warrior in life and will forever be remembered for her soft smile, beautiful eyes, caring heart, loving embrace, and unconditional love. Lori is survived by her husband, John, her children, um, Gabriel, Melissa, and John, and her stepdaughters, Regina, Rochelle, and Rosie, her mother, Virginia Montoya, and her sister, uh, Kelly, and her brother-in-law, Daniel, Daniel, as well as many grandchildren and a host of loving nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends. I wanna say to her family how sorry we are for your loss and for our own, and tell you that the county was better because she served here. Thank you. You have another. I do. Um, this this uh, adjournment is uh, in honor of another friend um, and a leader in our community. And so today, I'm also asking that we adjourn in memory of Bishop Emeritus John Irwin Sr. I want to acknowledge and welcome his family who are joining us today. He had a big family, and I just want to acknowledge them. His wife of 66 years, Mother Norma Irwin, four daughters, Lady Valerie Smith, married to Valentino Smith, is also joining us today. Lady Deborah uh, Judkins Ramos, married to Peter Ramos, Dayton, Ohio. Lady D Darlena Mays, married to Kenneth Mays of the Greater Phoenix area, will also join us today. Senior Pastor Teresa Tate from San Jose is also joining us today. In addition, he has three sons, Mr. Robert Irwin of Vancouver, Washington, Mr. Tony Allen of Dayton, Ohio, and Dr. John Irwin Jr. married to Linda Irwin of San Jose, California. He has 19 grandchildren, three of them joining us today, Janice Richard and Dr. Natalie Watson and 20 great, uh, 20 great grandchildren and one great, great grandchild, along with a, just an enormous family. Uh, Bishop John Emery Irwin was born in Calhoun, Georgia on August 25th, 1936. He was Ani and Ella's youngest child. As a baby of the family growing up, he was affectionately referred to as Little John. Although the family had deep connections to the South and a vast community across central Georgia, the horrors of the Jim Crow South pushed the family north in search of new opportunities. At the tender age of four, little John and his family relocated to Dayton, Ohio. After graduating from Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar High School in June 1953, Bishop Irwin enlisted in the Air Force to help serve his country during the Korean War. In December 1957, at the age of 21, Bishop Irwin's life went to even higher heights. He was baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost at Bethesda Temple in Dayton, Ohio. Bishop Irwin founded the 
Bethesda Community Church in 1986 in San Jose, California, and served as its pastor, a senior pastor for 20 years. Bethesda, which means pool of mercy, truly became a place of hope and healing for many across Santa Clara County, with Bishop Irwin's main commitments being to provide hope to the hopeless and to build strong families. In 2015, Bishop Irwin was elevated to the office of Bishop Emeritus of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, known as PAW, a pinnacle of his service to his local church in the California district and the national offices. In 2018, Bishop Irwin stepped up as pivotal bishop when his daughter, Pastor Teresa Tate, became senior pastor of Kingdom Worship Center International. Bishop Irwin was known as the chief motivator his prayers, innovative ideas and strategies, and unwavering support pushed the KWCI's leadership to become a refuge of, of refuge and training for the Santa Clara County community. Bishop Irwin also founded our local and beloved John John's Barbecue Restaurant in 1995. John John's Barbecue Restaurant was featured in the San Jose Mercury News' 2014 online, Eight Ways to Tell If Your Favorite Barbecue Joint is Authentic. John John's also won first place in the Santa Clara University's entrepreneurial competition. In 2014, John John's Barbecue also went mobile, become a fan favorite food truck during the official 49er tailgate parties inside the Faithful Mile at Levi Stadium. Because of his 40 plus years of community service in June 2016, Bishop Irwin was inducted into the top dad of Silicon Valley Hall of Fame and was recognized by the late Honorable Judge Sharon Chapman at the Building Peaceful Family Awards Luncheon. He leaves behind an immense legacy and will truly, truly be missed. And I wanna thank his family for letting us honor him today. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Um, Today, I'm uh, adjourning in the honor uh, of uh, two very special individuals. First is Dr. Sophia Jalali. Uh, Dr. Bertha Sophia Jalali was a lifetime, lifelong resident of our Bay Area who passed away unexpectedly on June 25th at the age of 20, 54, same age as me. She was a family practice physician. She survived by her husband, David, her brother, Jose, and sisters, Kathy and Layla. Dr. Jelly is predeceased by her parents, Carmen and Min. She was a devoted wife, mother, and a compassionate caregiver to all that she touched. She loved the arts, gardening, traveling, running, wine tasting, and a huge San Francisco Giants and 49ers fan. She's also an athlete, marathon runner, and a fabulous and caring clinician. She graduated from UC Irvine College of Medicine and served her residency at the Family Practice Residency at the San Bernardino County Medical Center, focusing on the diverse health needs of children and families. She worked at the Good Sam Hospital in El Camino, Los Gatos, and as part of the South Bay American Medical Women's Association. Her colleagues thought extremely highly of her, and would say she has an amazing personality and would always light up the room. She's smart, courteous, always professional, and has a great sense of humor to boot. Today, we adjourn in the memory of Dr. Bertha Sophia Jalai. Her spirit will always remain with us. Her colleague, Dr. Gloria Wu, co-president of the South Bay American Medical Women's Association, um, will have a few words. Please go ahead, Dr. Uh, Wu. Okay. Um... Okay, um, I'm Dr. Gloria Wu. Uh, I can't start my video. Um, okay, here. Uh, okay, I'm Dr. Gloria Wu. I'm an ophthalmologist, co-president of South Bay American Medical Women's Association. Dr. Julie Lee was one of our members, our friend and colleague. She had a fabulous personality and every time she walked in the room with her, uh, perfectly groomed suits and high heels. She was a lot of fun. We had our monthly meetings and we all loved her. Some of us ran with her on marathons and we all love her fabulous spirit. And she was a wonderful clinician. One of her patients said that she was the best. She was smart, courteous, and professional. She had so many five-star Yelp reviews that was it's very hard to count all this. And as we all know, it's hard to get 
millions of five-star reviews, but she achieved it. She has exemplified the best in medicine and we all miss her. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, if that concludes um, your adjournment for her, we'll move yeah. on to your second one. Thank you. For the second adjournment is for Gurdjieff, I'll go by Dave Singman, was the beloved son of the late Atma Singman and Malkit Kalman, a long-term pil pillar in our community who passed away on August 6th. Dave has left a tremendous void in our community as well as in the hearts of his family and friends. Dave is survived by his beloved wife, Binder Kalman, his sons, Gary and Ricky, daughter-in-law, Deepi, grandchildren, Sahani and Najuni, mother, Malki Kalman, brothers, Mohinder Singh Man and Jatinder Singh Man, along with an extended and close-knit family, all of whom have lost a bright light. Dave was a loving husband, present father, loyal son, a steadfast brother, a great uncle, and a giant in the lives of so many, whether on the tennis court, coaching youth sports, or generously volunteering his time to the community. He immigrated to San Jose in 1969 from Ganganagar, Rajasthan with his family. His family returned to Campbell, San Jose to be closer to the extended family, much of the insistence of Dave who even as a child valued the importance of being present for both one's family and community. Upon settling back in the South Bay with the extended family, they studied criminology at San Jose State while working various jobs ranging from landscaping to a line cook to help the family set up roots while his father worked on establishing a law practice in a new country. The family's hard work and dedication to achieving the American dream included officially establishing the Mann Law Firm in 1974 one of the longest standing local San Jose law firms, which Dave helped manage throughout his long duration, along with his brother, Mohinda Mann, and his son, Gary Mann, who continued the family tradition of practicing law, serving our community. Dave, you will be truly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And for our final adjournment in this morning's meeting, turn to Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, it, uh, it's my privilege this morning to ask that we adjourn in memory of a gentleman named Paul Nyberg. Uh, Paul passed away earlier this month at the age of 89 uh, and um, was uh, widely known in the North County and in Los Altos, Los Altos Hills in particular, uh, as the publisher of the town crier for more than a quarter of a century. Um, as I listen to our in memoriams this morning, I'm struck by uh, the diversity of life experience that uh, each of these local residents uh, brings to um, their time here with us in the county. Uh, in Paul's case, uh, he grew up in a farm, uh, pretty rural environment outside Hinckley, uh, Minnesota, uh, literally went to a uh, one room uh, schoolhouse was one of eight kids working on the farm, helping his father uh, build barns, uh, fix whatever needed fixing, uh, milking the cows. Uh, eventually uh, found his way into uh, the armed forces uh, during the Korean War, uh, went on to attend college on the GI Bill and ultimately earned his master's degree in journalism from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, he, uh, ended up in Los Altos, uh, gosh, all the way back in the mid-1970s, uh, met his wife, Liz, uh, at a church uh, function. Uh, they married and uh, really established themselves as folks who were ingrained in the community. Uh, Mr. Nyberg had, uh, Paul had uh, been in the magazine publishing industry for, gosh, four decades, I think. Uh, but uh, in, in one sense, started a new career in his 60s when he and Liz acquired the Los Altos town crier. And um, they saw their role as newspaper owners and publishers uh, as uh, more than just delivering the paper. Uh, they really threw themselves into being a part of the community and to making sure that the paper was uh, a part of the community. And 
um, that was really their commitment for, as I say, more than a quarter of a century. Uh, they focused on hyper-local news, the information that uh, the people we represent really need and care about in terms of going about their uh, daily lives uh, and uh, really celebrated community involvement in a way that uh, only a local paper can. Um, Paul and I did not always see eye to eye. Uh, he had a, uh, a different uh, take on some issues, not all, but we, uh, I think, always respected one another's uh, role in the community, whether it was his role as a publisher, my role as a public official, uh, and I always felt that I could uh, pick up the phone or dash off an email, and I knew that uh, he and the paper were there to uh, hear my side of the story. So uh, his his role in community activities, everything from the Los Altos, uh, Los Alton of the Year, which was an annual event, and the Los Altos Cultural Association, and the Olympic wannabes, I mean, they're just thing after thing after thing, breakfast club, uh, the pulling together folks informally. I'm thinking of uh, back to the El Camino Hospital and the school superintendents, uh, the work with local city managers. Uh, he just, as I say, really felt that a community newspaper should be a part of the community. Uh, he gave us that with his wife, Liz, for um, more than a quarter of a century. And so we not only memorialize his passing, but say thank you for uh, what he brought to the community. Uh, there is a celebration of life scheduled on October the 15th uh, at the Los Altos History Museum and donations in Paul's name uh, can be made either to the museum or the Los Altos Rotary Endowment Fund. And I just wanted to take this moment to convey our sympathies as a board to uh, wife Liz and uh, to the kids, the stepkids, the grandkids, and even the great grandkids. So thank you for that. And uh, again, a life uh, richly and fully lived. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty, and lots of amazing people all around us, and so many of them so very modest that uh, they won't tell you about themselves. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to commendations and proclamations. I'm gonna start off. Do we have Sharon Kreider here? Nancy, to your knowledge, is she? I do not see her in the room. Hold on, I'm looking in attendees. This is Rhonda, by the way. Hey, Rhonda. She is not on in either. All right, well, I hope Sharon and her friends are listening to this. Sharon Kreider was appointed by the Board of Supervisors to the Santa Clara County Assessment Appeals Board and has served on Assessment Appeals Board 3 since 2010. Whereas Sharon Kreider is a certified public accountant in good standing for 45 years, and has served on the Silicon Valley YMCA board for 20 years as treasurer and finance chair for two terms as an, and, and as an audit chair for one term. Whereas Sharon Kreider has addressed various issues regarding property assessments, assessment appeal processes, and procedures in property tax law, and was the only female among the nine members serving on the three assessment appeals board. Whereas Sharon Kreider has ably served the County of Santa Clara as member of the Assessment Appeals Board adjudicating more than 9,000 appeal matters and has engaged in more than 30 special hearings and deliberations involving Silicon Valley companies. Whereas Sharon Kreider has provided over 10 years of excellent service to the County of Santa Clara and during that time has demonstrated diligent professionalism as an Assessment Appeals Board member. Whereas Sharon Kreider, by her experience and expertise, provided exceptional service to the County of Santa Clara by asking the community, by assisting the community in making informed and legal decisions regarding fair property tax assessments. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby honor and commend Sharon Kreider for her dedicated service to the residents of Santa Clara County and extends best wishes to Ms. Kreider in all her future endeavors passed and adopted by the Board of Supes uh, today. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, this commendation, I, I feel like really and any member of our board could be sharing it because we all have a, a, a personal connection, I think, to Reverend Jeff Moore. 
And I, I think he's with us today. And if he is, I'd love him to turn on his camera. Um, today, I have the honor and the privilege of presenting a commendation to Reverend Jethro Moore II. As Reverend Moore starts his new journey in Atlanta, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank and honor him for his amazing service to all of us in Santa Clara County. Reverend Moore is a graduate of Silver Creek High School and received an Associate of Arts degree from Evergreen Valley College and a Bachelor of Science degree in Bible Theology Management and Ethics from San Jose Christian College. He served with distinction for 13 years as president of the San Jose Silicon Valley National Association of the, for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Reverend Moore also served with distinction as a member of the county's juvenile justice system collaborative. And he spent his life driven by determination to bringing racial and social justice to not just our community, but communities across the country. He has been a champion and a voice for the most vulnerable in our community and leaves a legacy of service, advocacy, and, and frankly, um, energy that I think many, many people admired because of how long and how hard he worked. It is with great pleasure that I present this commendation virtually to you, Reverend Moore, to recognize and commend him for his years of tireless dedication, commitment, and advocacy for all of our residents in Santa Clara County. Thank you, Reverend Moore, for your amazing service. And I wanted to give you, I think we're giving you a round of applause of virtual, um, and I wanted to give you a chance to say a few words. Thank you. And then a few others of us have comments to make as well. Oh, do you want them to go first and then Reverend Moore? Yeah, why don't we do that? Supervisor Ellen. Thanks so much, uh, Supervisor Chavez. I really appreciated your noting that any one of us could have made this, this commendation. And I just want to add my own gratitude, Reverend Moore. You have been um, a friend and an advisor to me and an always thoughtful listener. Um, helping me, me wrestle with challenging issues. Um, we were regular, regular companions at, um, at so many uh, demonstrations and protests. And I just, um, I will really miss you on a personal level. I, I have really enjoyed getting to know you. I have appreciated your leadership and guidance um, and hope that there's an opportunity to keep in touch across the country. Best wishes. It certainly is. Supervisor Lee? Or Smidian, either of you wish to add on? Otherwise, I will. Yes, uh, uh, certainly. Re Reverend Moore, as I call him Jeff so many times, uh, many people always get your name confused, being J-E-T-H and J-E-F-F, -F, and I believe you accept all of them, right? Yes. Uh, and again, really, really amazing hero of our community, uh, not just working on WCV, but you know, you're really everywhere, uh, not only at the protest, I mean, at the, your, your, your bravery. Uh, and selfless uh, devotion to our community is 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 really hard to match. Uh, I mean, having been literally at the front line uh, at the, the protests of BLM, uh, and and how you have been out there actually really kept many people safe and safe life by being there. And I just wanted to 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 say that I admire your courage and commitment for all you do. We miss you here. I hope you can come back, and I'll do whatever I can to make that happen if it has been possible. Uh, but again, uh, really appreciate all your awesome work. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. Uh, Reverend, I, I find the easiest way to make sure names are straight is just call you Reverend. That seems to always work. So I, I'm going to stay in that safe uh, place, if I may. Uh, but, uh, you know, on a serious note, uh, you know, others have and will thank you for the work you've done. But I also want to thank you for the comments you shared with the community uh, publicly recently uh, about your decision to exit the scene. And the challenges we face here in this county in terms of making it a place that is truly hospitable, truly welcoming, truly respectful of a truly diverse community. I, I think you exhort us to keep those challenges top of mind and to do a better job, quite frankly. And uh, I just wanted to share with you in a public forum, the fact that those words had meaning for me and will uh, stay with me uh, as uh, we do our work here on the board. So thank you for what I will describe as that parting gift, truly. Thank you. And I'll close by saying it's uh, nice to see you choking up a little bit. So that, that's number one. And uh, I'm just going straight to Superman. 
I'm skipping Reverend. I'm going straight to Superman where you're plucking people off uh, railroad tracks before the, the train comes along. And uh, I've always appreciated your, your candidness, um, your, your honesty, your also your respect for other people. You, you were never shy about expressing your opinion and you always listened well to others. And um, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Reverend, what uh, final words do you have for us at this time? Um, I just want to say that um, I'm Peacock, Pro Peacock Proud and Honeymoon Happy to have received this Legacy Award by the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. I heard a wise man once say, a man who hates home will never be happy. And I'm drifting on a memory. There ain't no place I'd rather be than there with you. I would like to be remembered for my compassion, my humility, my persistence, and my trustworthiness, and my passion for my wife and sons, and seeing to make this world a better place in which all can strive and arrive at a better place within whom we are as a core values. At any time, when the Lord tells us to simply go, there are specific places God wants us to be at certain times so that he can use us and even bless us in ways that are specific to that particular location. Before we can ever know how we are to serve God, we must first come to learn where we are to serve God. And sometimes the answer is not a place, but it's a process. And I'm in the middle of that process. Supervisors, what do you see as the biggest hurdle right now? What occupies us the majority of your time these days? Is it housing? I want you to remember an article I read in Paul Walker Times book, and a lady talked about Joseph Eckler, who built affordable housing that was using innovative and imaginative architect housing and outdoors for the working class community. Those Eckler homes, she said, housed the Silicon's first wave of new, immigrant, new people to this valley. Steve Wozniak, she said, Apple's co-founder grew up in an Eckler home in Sunnyvale. The late Steve Jobs, she went on to say, created Eckler homes for inspire, that inspired him to create Apple's design products for the mass market. I love it when you can bring reality and great design and simple com compatibility to something that doesn't cost much, he said, of Eckler homes. Steve Jobs said it was his original vision for Apple that is why he tried to make with the first Mac so affordable. And I wanna say we must design housing today. Palo Alto, Almaden Valley, Los Gatos, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, and Los Altos. I implore you to initiate real and lasting changes in the housing situations for all. And how do we empower our community to become stronger? We, the people, must elect strong leaders and legislators who reflect support for diversity and inclusion. My desire was to bring a spirit of activism to fight against the ills of our community, systemic racism, the learned racism, and the inherited racism that still exists in our county. I was determined to work with all people who believe in justice. In 1993, Santa Clara County issued an upward mobility of all diverse workforce at all levels of the organization in order to move individuals beyond middle management and break the barrier of the glass season. And this past 2020, you, you guys declared racism as a public health crisis. So your DEI conversion is evolving to an anti-racist and inclusion. I want to tell you that inclusion starts with I. Each department head must say, how can I change the county? If they have been in a position for many years and things have not changed under them, change then with them is needed. Inclusion is creating a space of belonging and equitable opportunity, equity and in the fairness of all identities of that county. Start with the I when we talk about inclusion. And I'd just like to close with my condolences to the, and prayers to the Pastor Irwin family and to Mohander Mann and his family, and to the families of the people of Hades as they go through this earthquake. And again, I want to thank you. Uh, my family thanks you. And we're in the middle of a tornado watch here. And if I had the power, I would 
move some of the water to us because it's been raining all day here and it just doesn't <laughs> stop. But but thank you for the award and I'm truly humbled. Thank you, Reverend. All thank right. You, Jeff. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Before we move on to the next commendation from Supervisor Smithian, I would like to remind anybody wishing to speak under public comment, which comes up next, to please electronically register now, raise your hand so we have an idea of how many speakers we have. Supervisor Smithian. You're muted, sir. We are, now I am unmuted, thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, I want to say thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues, for the opportunity to uh, say a few words about uh, the extraordinary contributions of an extraordinary person, Barbara Avery, uh, who is uh, uh, moving on after uh, 37 years at El Camino Hospital, uh, 14 of which, these last 14 of which, uh, she served as uh, the Director of Community Benefit at El Camino Hospital and El Camino Healthcare District. Uh, doing extraordinary work on behalf of the community. I was uh, admonished by uh, my office uh, that I was not allowed to use the word retiring because uh, people said, no, 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 no. If you know Barbara and have watched her good work over the years, and I have had occasion to watch her good work over the years, you know that retiring is not the word you should use. This is really just an opportunity to sort of uh, make a thoughtful decision about the next chapter in her life. And I uh, have to believe in the continued story of good good works. Uh, for these past 37 years, and, and most particularly these past 14 years in the role as uh, Director of Community Benefit, Barbara has um, really led the effort uh, to make sure that community benefit grants went to, gosh, I think something more like 150 organizations uh, as we scan the list. Uh, with more than $100 million in funding to do, to do good works, particularly in our schools and that partnership that uh, Barbara has fostered over the, not just years now, but decades between our schools and our healthcare institutions um, is, is really a signature part of her work. And in fact, why she was recognized by the California School Nurses uh, Organization. I, I think um, it is sometimes most helpful to, to check in with folks who uh, have worked in partnership or collaboratively with uh, someone uh, we honor to get their take. And I was struck by uh, the comment from Josh Salo, who is a executive director over at West Valley Community Services, who just noted the impact that Barbara had, had and, uh, and commented that her, the impact of her work will be felt in our region for many years to come. It is a a lasting impact that we recognize today. Um, she uh, is uh, deeply committed to health, not only uh, institutionally, but personally. Uh, Mr. Wasserman, I can tell you that Barbara has even been on the cover of Runner's World twice and the Yoga Journal once uh, for her personal commitment to health and fitness. Uh, I am 0 for 3, uh, so we'll just let it go with that. Uh, but, but thank you, I appreciate that. But I uh, really do want to take a moment just to say uh, thank you for so, so much in the way of giving to the community through these good works. Uh, Barbara and her husband, Bill, live in Saratoga in my district and uh, raised their kids there. And um, just want to say thanks and wish her well, as I say, in this next chapter of her work, uh, knowing whatever that that may entail, uh, we will all be the better for it, I am sure. So thank you again, Mr. Chair. And Maybe we can turn to Barbara and give her a chance to say a word or two if she wishes. Barbara. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful acknowledgement and especially uh, Supervisor Smidian. Um, it's a very, very meaningful recognition. To have had the opportunity to work uh, for so many years for a wonderful organization like El Camino Health, who, um, uh, who's very focused in, um, in commitment to health, to have partnered with so many community-based organizations and school districts as, as Dr. Uh, Supervisor Smidian mentioned, and many of the other agencies in our organization. And also to have had the opportunity to 
work on large initiatives that the county has put forward in for the health of the entire uh, population that all fall in the service of, of addressing the unmet health needs of the most vulnerable members of our community. Um, it has given me such an immensely fulfilling and inspiring career. So I thank you again for this uh, deeply felt recognition. And I also wanna thank you for your just unrelenting focus on the health of the residents of this county. So thank you again. I'm not sure why my camera's not working, but um, thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to item number six on our agenda, which is public comment. This is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. So I know a hot topic is the um, lead study in Reed Hillview that will be uh, brought up during our six o'clock evening session. So now is not the time to speak on that. And uh, Nancy, I see 17 speakers. So let's just go with one minute each right now. Okay, one minute. Our first speaker is Carol Bruyette. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I'm sorry, we're not able to understand. Nancy, can you move on to the next speaker? We yes. Back. Our next speaker is Carrie. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Carol, if you can please unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Carrie. I did. You can begin. Oh, oh hello, yes. Yes. I wanted to address um, the group of uh, the county su supervisors, and I just wanted to talk about how these uh, masking mandates are going on. I don't understand why. We had nine deaths total in June, four deaths in July. Yesterday, 22 in all of California, 308 in the entire United States. All of these are based on cases using PCR tests that we all know are faulty. And I, don't, I just don't understand your reasoning behind it. And for anybody else who's on this uh, call, there is a recall for these Board of Supervisors. You can find it at www.recallsantaclara.com. And I hope everybody signs up for it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jane Kearney, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. I would like to address the um, upcoming two-tier system. It seems a lot like Nazi Germany to me when the Jews were required to wear gold stars, the unclean. The irony of passing laws about inclusion this morning is really striking because we are not including those who want to um, be in charge of their own bodies, the ultimate minority. I encourage you to look at the work of Dr. Peter Marcola, Dr. Tess Lori, Dr. Tenpenny, Dr. Peter Corey, and Dr. Scott Atlas. I'm unaware of any agency program that's ever been uh, voluntarily reduced, and I believe that this control of our health is going to be rapidly increasing. I'm not interested in taking my medical advice from a government who told me to eat margarine, we created the food pyramid, told us thalidomide was fine. Science is an evolving process by declaration, not consensus um, or a declaration. This vaccines are being done without proper informed consent and strikingly suspicious is the repression of early treatment and most strikingly, the idea that people who have had COVID don't have immunity, which is laughing, laughable by the CDC. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tessa Woodmanseep. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. James Baldwin says, that you know, if you love somebody, you make them conscious of the things they don't see. And the things that we're not seeing is the climate crisis that we're, we're dealing with, the, the fires that are raging in Siberia that are never going to go out. So, and I just heard today that the economic input, uh, impacts of 
um, not doing things, the tipping points that we're going to experience, that we are experiencing, the fires, the floods, they are going to get worse. And we have to change. We have to transformationally change. And what that means is to start growing food locally. And what that means is not using fossil fuels. And what that also means is not using cement. And so what we need to do is to grow food locally. Any open land should be designed to grow food. We need a demonstration project. And I have been promoting that in my neighborhood because my neighborhood is very highly impacted with pollution. That's why I have many cars and trucks and planes and, and, and buses. So we need to grow food. Our next speaker is Miranda Barker. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, uh, can you hear me all right? I just want to make Yes. Okay, my name is Miranda and I work at Momentum for Mental Health. Um, I wanted to request that more money be put into the behavioral health system and that the contracts are reviewed with nonprofit agencies to give us a little bit more flexi flexibility um, with the clients that we're able to see. Um, since COVID, we've seen an increase of patients in our residential facilities that are not fit for our level of care. And we're being told that we need to just kind of deal with it and take in these patients. Um, some examples are clients with walkers and diapers when we're not a nursing facility. And we've also had three assaults um, in April, June, and July. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pelican Junkie at sbcglobal.net. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. Yes. I'm um, speaking because you are requiring people to get a vaccination. It's not even a vaccination. It's in a human experiment. There's a lot of information out there in the atmosphere that speaks to the truth. I guess uh, most of the time though, I don't think any of you know what the truth is because you certainly don't speak through your lips with it. There is no law, there is no outline, there is no guideline, there's no policy, there is no mandate. There is no word out there supersedes the United States Constitution. You don't have a right to tell anybody what they put in their bodies. And we will push back. Thank you. Our next speaker is Uday Kapoor. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, Uday Kapoor representing NAMI. I'm on the board. And as you, many of you know. I'm sorry, I have muted you. Please unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, my apologies. Okay, thank you. Uday Kapoor, I am on the board of NAMI Santa Clara County. And as you know, I am advocating for uh, residential care facilities. There's been a real loss and many of you know that I've been very upset and I've spoken to you. And what I sense is that it is now taking a back seat. And when I question the process, why we don't have it, we are told, uh, why do we need a process? Why do we need a database? And that's very upsetting. And I think we need to examine the priorities of finding why we are losing board and care facilities and how we can create more. I've been working with David Mineta and I spoke at the health and hospital committee meeting. And I know Supervisor Lee had promised to get back to me, uh, which he has not. So I would appreciate if you would we'll talk uh, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Nancy, I'm gonna interrupt for a minute and just say to everybody, this is the last call to raise your hand. And um, after we get whatever hands raised now in the next few, the next minute or so, then we will close it to new speakers. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, uh, Supervisors. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, there is a, 
there is a uh, the twelfth step of Alcoholics Anonymous says that having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other addicts or alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And I don't see Lori Lori Palomo was a very good example of that. You know, when I got out of prison, I went to the reentry center. And, and sometimes for a person like me, a Chicano from San Jose, sometimes you just can't like relate to certain people, you know, but, but Lori was one that I could. I mean, she was, I mean, just right when you saw her, she just screamed old school chola, you know? And, and, and so, so there was that, 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 that kind of love, but, you know, I mean, just, you know, she would just break your ego too at the same time. You know, and, 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 and the county had people like that. The county uh, ensured that there was people that when they were getting out of these institutions and they were going to the reentry center, that there were the Lori Palomos of, of the community that were there, you know, and, and, and she, she inspired hope, you know, uh, as she's connected to one of the, one of the uh, 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 families there in the horseshoe. And and so so there's 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 like a loss. There's a there's a specific community loss that that the horseshoe specifically is experiencing as a result of her death. And so I just want to say that uh, you got your money's worth, the county, and the community uh, both benefited and 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 lost somebody very special. And I just uh, thank you for uh, bringing her as a uh, as a in memoriam of of, of Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And Nancy, we've done a last call for speaker cards now. So the 24 remaining speakers that we have will be it for this public comment. Okay, thank you. Donna Mensimer, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute. Good morning, Donna Mensimer with SEMA. SEMA is a pro-vaccine union. On August 5th, SEMA members' phones began to blow up as other managers, supervisors, and staff looked for answers for a memo that was just sent out. SEMA members listened to the concerns, noted the questions, tried to provide calm to county employees who have done an amazing job navigating COVID-19 protocols, policies, memos, mandates, DFW assignments, and more. The next day, we reached out to Labor Relations and EOD to get answers to all the questions. Questions like, what happens to those who don't get vaccinated? Are booster shots part of being fully immunized? Will employees on long-term leave have to comply prior to return? How will employees' departments be notified of the exemption statuses? It was obvious the county had not met with any of these departments to determine processes, identify needed resources, or estimate reasonable timelines to implement, as no one had an answer. If SEMA had the opportunity to meet and confer, we could have brought up these issues and been a partner in this process. SEMA asked for a two-week delay and direction that labor relations bargain in good faith. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rhoda Fry. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. And you have one minute. As a second highest payer of pollution fees in our state, Lehigh Cement pays BACMED over $1 million annually. I believe that BACMED chronically underestimates pollution to appease their big customers. In 2019, BACMED settled with a whistleblower for $3.75 million. In the complaint, BACMED's lawyers illegally ordered destroying pollution records. In 2014, Palo Alto Airport recorded very high lead levels. BACMED's lead monitor was removed and has yet to be replaced. In 2020, Lehigh's new rock plant application failed cancer risk calculations, and BACMED's lawyers called for recalculating. Now, unwashed aggregate is spilling dust and debris onto our streets, residents, and likely workers. Lehigh should not be permitted by BACMED, or the county for that matter, to sell unwashed aggregate to the detriment of our health. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carl Guardino. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute. Good morning. My name is Carl Guardino. I'm honored to serve as executive vice president for Bloom Energy, a clean, resilient energy company founded right here in Silicon Valley with 900 local jobs. I'm asking each of you to consider joining me this Sunday morning, August 22nd, for our inaugural Stars and Strides community run to support and celebrate our frontline hospital workers and the patients they serve 
in recognition of their selfless service throughout the COVID crisis. Our ambitious goal is to raise a quarter of a million dollars for the Valley Medical Center Foundation. And we are hoping that you can participate personally with your family. The registration is easy at starsandstridesrun.com. And we are hoping you will also help spread the word to your community networks so that we can celebrate these selfless leaders who have been serving us throughout these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Linda Edwards and I'm a Santa Clara County employee. I do not agree with the vaccine mandates. I am really disappointed to see that my county is resorting to forcing people to get shots they don't want. This is an affront to the very principles of liberty in this country and you are overstepping your authority. I can decide what is best for my body and it is my choice whether I get the experimental COVID shots or not. As a county employee, I was considered an essential worker at the start of the pandemic and asked to come into work exposing myself to increased risk. And I did. Then I was asked to be a disaster service worker at a vaccination clinic where I was exposed to tens of thousands of people and potential increased risk of COVID. And I did. You gave us certificates of appreciation and called us heroes for our service. I have complied with every directive up until now. Now you are threatening us that if we don't get these experimental COVID shots, we will lose our jobs. That is not right. Stop the vaccine mandates now. Thank you. Our next speaker is PJ Kearns. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. President Wasserman and uh, supervisors, I wanna thank you for the fantastic work you have done in leading us through the COVID crisis. Separately, um, municipalities in our county have submitted comments to the CPUC anticipating the impact of the application by San Jose Water's increased revenue on over 20,000 families living under the threat of water disconnection. The families um, cannot pay their bills and there is this threat that lingers even though it is um, managed by moratorium at this time. But I think that the county should raise its concerns with the CPUC who will be very supportive of your comments to consider de eliminating disconnection. Our next speaker is Janet Diaz Perez. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Good morning, my name is Janet Diaz, SEIU chapter president, PBS clerk and county employee for 21 years. I'd like to thank the board for items 22 and 23. This is a step toward addressing the understaffing within mental health. Just as important is to eliminate contracting out janitorial and food service work and addressing recent discoveries of several active contracts, outsourcing PBS clerk coding hit and hit jobs as the contractors safely worked via remote access. The county failed to meet and notice SEIU prior to implementation. Throughout this pandemic, we continuously asked the county to do right by the endless sacrifices of county workers. The ARP funds clearly indicate that a portion of the funding are to pr provide essential worker pay. We believe 2,500 should be awarded to each essential worker as we are not invincible. Instead, we have proven to be essential. Thank you. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. All right, this is Blair Beekman. Um, from words just uh, previously spoken, you know, we're entering a new era of subsidy and really, really large amounts of subsidy from the state and federal levels. Uh, I hope at the county and local level, you can learn to really explain these subsidy programs to everyday community and you make it an open process and uh, that can help answer a lot of questions. This is a time we don't fear things. This is a time we trust each other and, and, and explain things to each other. With that said, I'm really sorry. I've been trying to explain my interpretations of uh, possible uh, upcoming natural disasters in the Bay Area uh, in the next few years and decades. Um, 
gosh darn it, I did not offer the concept that, you know, we have to deal with the concept of a uh, disaster capitalism practices in these natural disaster tendencies. We need to address these and minimize these practices so things in Haiti don't happen here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heather Gibson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmuting. You have one minute to speak. Hi, my name is Heather Gibson. I've been a healthcare attorney and a civil rights attorney for the past 15 years or so. And I'm objecting to the violations of the Brown Act. They've been ongoing with this board. Um, you're limiting everyone to one minute and regardless, irrespective of what it may say in your rules about what you can limit it to, that is not the test for compliance under the Brown Act. It is what is reasonable under the circumstances. Um, you can see, um, you know, everything going on this morning, all of your discussion, uh, there's, there's plenty of time. You can give more time to people. Three minutes to five minutes would be just fine. And that is why I am going to reserve the right to null and void any decision you make, any vote you take going forward with respect to the coronavirus, any mandates, um, you have a lot of upset people, they have the right to speak. I don't know if you're afraid or not, but there's a reason why you're doing this remotely. Our next speaker is Jeff. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Millions of Americans are saying no to coerced injections of pharmaceutical products and will not comply with COVID tyranny. COVID-19 is a Trojan horse being used in a fraudulent manner to attempt to dismantle the Bill of Rights, Constitution, and human freedoms. COVID-19 policy is based on a foundation of fraud. It's being fraudulently diagnosed with the fatally flawed PCR procedures. You supervisors are simply pawns in a cruel and fraudulent political crime against the people, coordinated by powerful people at the top who are running this clown show. The results of the PCR procedure are easily manipulated and subject to misuse and abuse by varying the sensitivity of the test, by changing the number of cycles. Science requires open debate and discussion not happening here. Watch censored videos, tinyurl.com slash 2YH2Z4HW. Our next speaker is Jason Dorsey. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Good morning, Jason Dorsey, SEIU Chapter Vice President. We, has, we are uh, con we're continuing to bargain with the County on the vaccines mandate, but Santa Clara County must do better. We know that when we partner, we can we can do well, but we cannot continue with ESA's department's continued words of collaboration, but their actions are completely contrary. The board encouraged telework due to the pandemic, and we learned that it can be done. This is a fourth COVID surge, and department management are denying telework requests from its members. The county can lead the way as an employer of proper telework plans that meet the needs of the departments while keeping the workers and the public safe as we try to find balance. We also must work together to ensure that we stop this blatant contracting out that is starting to plague our county and with jobs being contracted out to workers in other states and counties. We need our, your leadership to stop this wasteful spending and invest in a workforce by working with us in the robust workforce training and development plan that we can work on together. Our next speaker is Yvonne. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Thank you. Good morning, Santa Clara County Department um, Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak this morning. I um, am very concerned with the mandatory vaccines that Santa Clara County is imposing on its employees. Uh, never before have we seen this happen in the government level, on the local level especially, and I would just urge you to reconsider that. We don't know what's in the vaccine, and at this point, the CDC, the VAERS website of deaths and other crippling effects from the vaccines are being seen. You're impacting families, children, and spouses of the county employees. And so I urge you to just honor the opportunity to say yes to the vaccine or to opt out and test weekly. These are our rights, and these leaders of our families it's going to impact the family household, the children, and it's a, a reoccurring effect. It's not just an individual who's a county employee. So I just implore you, please honor the religious exemption because of that conviction that we have to refrain from this vaccine that has yet to be FDA approved. 
Our next speaker is Adam Cole. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Good morning. SEMA is a pro-vaccine union. However, administration presented a false choice, vaccine mandate or a safe workplace. The county returned SEMA workers to the worksite last month, a worksite the county now states is so dangerous it must mandate vaccination. However, Many departments and SEMA employees had equivalent or higher productivity during the lockdown and while teleworking. If the workplace is so dangerous that the county must mandate vaccination, then it is dangerous enough that all SEMA members should resume telework and social distancing immediately where we can do so without loss of services. This will be safer for staff and for the public. Your safest hospital appointment or social services appointment is one where only essential staff are present. If there are thousands of additional support staff needlessly present, then there are thousands of additional vectors for the Delta variant to cause breakthrough cases of COVID. Keep Santa Clara staff and residents safe. We ask for a two week delay while we bargain impacts of this policy. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Uh, hello, can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, kind of a couple of weird buttons popped up right there. Um, Scott Largent here. I was uh, hoping the uh, county has shut off the um, the water bottle supply for the uh, homeless and mentally ill. Um, they're basically, there's a certain process in place. You know, normally I go over there with Richard Scott's truck and, you know, I fill it up with water. We distribute it out to the homeless. Um, the water fountains have been completely caged off. Um, they've been disabled, and a lot of people now are drinking from irrigation water. Um, I don't have the little clock on here right now, so I'm sure I'm almost to my time, but this is a very important thing. This is kind of a human right issue. Um, so I, I would ask you guys to look into this immediately and start getting water out to people. It, it's just sad. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Bobson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. I'm curious why we're not in person. I just feel like this is insane. Who's paying for you? Who's paying for this or who's threatening you? We will find the truth and change the crimes against humanity. How can all of you on this board not question all the inconsistencies in the mandates and the vaccine safety? Wear masks, don't wear masks. Children are safe, children aren't. Vaccines work and you will be safe from the virus and be able to be free of mandates. Now we're not. Non-vaccine people will infect you. How can you believe this? It's untrue. Healthy people infecting others, that's insane. Our rights are completely being obliterated and what's happened to the constitution? You're not following it. In addition to the threat of the Delta virus is to impose fear and bully those not vaccinated. It's sick, just sick. And who are you people? How do you feel and have the right to decide what we do with our bodies? You don't, it's unlawful. The shutdown last year was deadly to my child with two suicide attempts. I will make each and every one of you personally liable and if my child is harmed again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute. Hi, this is Matthew. Uh, thank you, County, for the work and the service you do to, to serve our county. And, and I see that you all are people that have truly dedicated your hearts and your lives to try to do what's right for the people of this county. And, and we really appreciate that. I wanna respectfully take issue with something Yvonne previously said, that never before have we seen these types of mandates. That is untrue. The Nuremberg Code 1947 was written by a generation we call the greatest generation to us for a time like this now, so that we know how to avoid a repeat of the atrocity of Nazi Germany's angel of death, Joseph Mengele. The COVID vaccine is twice experimental, both as a vaccine and as a brand new use of mRNA technology. If you read the Nuremberg Code, item one says the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential going on without the intervention of any element of force, any fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. I would please encourage you all to carefully read this code, study it, understand it, hear what it says, and please also hear the voices of the other our next speaker is Marianne Waddell. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. <clears throat> Morning, thank you. My name is Marianne Waddell. I am a social worker at DFCS. I'm also the vice chair for the SSU chapter and Stuart. Um, 
thank you for this opportunity. I want to say that I, I'm in agreement with, we need to be able to negotiate. It is not okay that we're um, being made to wear masks in an office next to everyone, that no social distancing is being put in place and we're being vaccinated for our safety, but yet coming into the office next to everybody and working in close proximity is okay. Um, there's no guidelines in regards to how many people can be at the building at the same time. And it is impacting the community we serve by exposing all of us and then exposing all of them, including our families at home. Um, further, we'd like to use the American Resource Plan funds to support our disaster service workers as everyone maintains services for our county. And Nancy, before you move on to our um, the final eight that we've got, Gail Osmer wrote me 20 minutes ago. She was trying to get on, was unable to get on in the deadline, but is able to get on now. So if you can please recognize her at the end. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hello, Board of Supervisors. I have read so many posts from people all over the world describing adverse reactions they have had from the COVID injections. They range from mild reactions to death. Please go to the Telegram app where information is not censored and search for COVID vaccine injuries. People have posted pictures, videos, and written testimonies of what they and their loved ones have experienced after having these injections. Neurological damage is a big one. Blood, blood, blood clots is another big issue causing strokes, heart attacks, and death. One healthcare worker had to have both her legs and her hands amputated due to blood clots. You want to mandate these injections for people to be able to work. People will have to make a serious decision and some of them may have to quit, quit their job because of this. Please check out the Bears reporting system at the CDC. The last time I checked, there were over 12,000 deaths and over 500,000 adverse reactions, which is only one to 10% of, of, of the truly uh, events. Please allow people to decide for themselves whether they want to partake in an experimental gene therapy. It is always the best part. Our next speaker is Prabhakar Isaac. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Go ahead, Carl. Um, RecallSantaClara.com. That's the first thing I'd like to say. This is a huge slap in the face to all of those people who were quote unquote heroes last year during this time. Um, we have nurses and doctors who have actually looked in the face of COVID, have seen the disaster it, can, it, it, it causes, and still don't want to get the vaccines. And yet we're supposed to take the advice of ivory tower cowards who, who, who don't even come out to see the public in person, who hide behind computer screens. It's really funny that you guys feel that our jobs should be on the line for these ma mandatory vaccines, but I believe your jobs should be on the line for these mandatory vaccines. That's why I'm promoting RecallSantaClara.com. And I'm gonna tell you this right now, if I lose my job, I'm gonna use whatever severance retirement money that I get to put forth donations towards Recall Santa Clara and to fund every single one of your opponents. And at that point, I'll have free time. So I'll be out signing, getting petition signed and making sure all five of you are removed. Our next speaker is Sinbad. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. I just want to speak on behalf of conservatives, Republicans, and President Trump supporters that have been ostracized for the last five and a half years, being labeled as racist, fascist, and extremist, while the com communist left Democrats are in fact racist, fascist, and extremist, and have destroyed every community they touch. They are the dictating the lives of others. I don't know how you sleep at night. And like you, Biden's war generals are focused on CRT and pronouns instead of their jobs to protect. And we see how that went. At this rate, you're all equivalent to the Taliban and you're going to cause war in our streets due to the due to the division that your illegal mandates create. You should all be ashamed of you. And I second recall all of you. Our next speaker is Zeb Feldman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Zeb. Good, morning. Uh, good morning. Zeb Feldman with SEMA OE3. Let me be clear. SEMA is a pro-vaccine union. Let me be equally clear. The rollout of this vaccine mandate has been a farce by ESA. 
We are not here to halt a mandate, but to make it workable for our employees and improve the policy as a thoughtful, powerful partner. SEMA had requested to meet for more than a month and was ignored. On August 6th, the county announced a slapdash policy filled with operational gaps and a pre-decided implementation date. SEMA met and all our well-reasoned impacts and changes have been ignored by ESA. This vaccine mandate is perhaps the most important policy of the year and deserves full review from employees and the board. SEMA, an 85% vaccinated union, is a natural ally. Treating SEMA employees as an afterthought with closed ears forces us into a defensive position. SEMA asks to delay implementation by two weeks so we can properly negotiate this important policy. Thank you for your kind attention. Our next speaker is Lisa. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Lisa, can you please unmute yourself? Okay, we will come back to her. Our next speaker is Lydia Koo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Thank you, good morning. I'm Lydia Koo, council member of the city of Palo Alto. I co-authored the colleague's memo for Palo Alto to have a safe parking program. And I'm here today to seek your help to ensure this program will succeed. Many church sites are located within residential zones and it is a balance of working together. Together means neighboring residents and the faith organizations, the city, the county, region and state. The homelessness issue is bigger than one city or or organization and taking a top-down approach does not encourage collaboration. It lessens transparency, creates animosity and a difficult road to help those most in need. I'm requesting that you help to ensure the success of our safe parking program by requiring criminal screening and to disqualify violent crimes and sexual offenders from the program. We are implementing a new program and it needs to be embraced by those who already live in the city and are going to be neighbors. Thank you for your consideration. Our next speaker is Gail Osmer. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Good morning. Uh, first off, um, thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Um, I wanna start off by thanking the Office of Supportive Housing for the last year or so. They've been providing us water for our unhoused folks. It's been wonderful. Last Wednesday, um, I tried to get a hold of Linda Jones from um, Office of Supportive Housing for a couple of days and was told that they are no longer giving out water for our unhoused folks. I went to one of the supervisors and um, the response that um, Linda Jones has given and the county has given is they're not doing water except um, when there's a, um, a weather alert, um, which is just unbelievable because we don't have those very often. On June 22nd, I got 22 cases of water. I hand out cases to many encampments. Something is going on, something has changed. They're saying public affairs has made this decision. I, I would like to know what- We are going to retry Lisa. Lisa, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Lisa, can you please unmute yourself? And Lisa seems to be experiencing technical difficulties. That concludes our public comment. Thank you very much. That ends item number six. We now move on to item number seven, which is our consent calendar and changes to the agenda. And Nancy, why don't you start uh, reading down the list and we'll follow you. Okay. Um, we have a correction to item number 5A. The item should read as follows. Present commendation for Sharon Kreider for over 10 years of service as a member of Assessment Appeal Board 3. Request from Supervisor Chavez to delete item number 5C. Item 5C is a presentation of commendation for Atticus Ginsburg for achieving the highest Boy Scout rank of Eagle Scout. The commendation will be adopted under item number 104A. 
We have a request from President Wasserman to add item number 14 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to approve referral to administration to report to the board on September 14th, 2021 with the written plan to administer and or coordinate booster shots of the COVID-19 vaccine for those who live or work in the county. We have a request from President Wasserman, Vice President Allenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item numbers 15, 16, 17, and 18 to the consent calendar. Item number 15 is to approve county sponsorship of the Healthier Kids Foundation in the amount of $5,000 to support the 20th annual benefit celebrating kids. Item number 16 is to approve county sponsorship of the Sunny Hills Neighborhood Association in the amount of $2,000 to support the Sunny Hills Neighborhood Association Halloween party. Item number 17 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsoring the Asian Americans for community involvement, Better Together Gala. Item number 18 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsoring the Health Trust 25th anniversary virtual celebration. We have a request from President Wasserman to hold item number 22, I'm sorry, 21, 22, and 23 to August 31st, 2021. Item number 21 is to consider recommendations relating to assisted outpatient treatment. Item number 22 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 25 in the amount of $1,515,633, increasing revenue and expenditures in the Behavioral Health Services Department budget relating to adding 11 positions for the assistant outpatient treatment program. Item number 23 is the adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.12 relating to the compensation of employees adding various positions in behavioral health services. We have a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Chavez to consider item numbers 25, 26, and 27 concurrently. Item number 25 is to receive report relating to the Vietnamese American Service Center. Item number 26 is to consider recommendations relating to staffing and programming at the Vietnamese American Service Center. Item number 27 is the adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.18 relating to compensation of employees, adding one community outreach specialist position and five office specialist three positions in the office of the county executive. We have a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Lee to add item number 29 to the consent calendar. Item number 29 is to receive report on options for consideration relating to obtaining certification by Welcoming America. We have a request from Supervisor, I'm sorry, from President Wasserman, Vice President Allenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item number 30 to the consent calendar. Item number 30 is to receive quarterly report relating to the 2021 Data Privacy Day event. We have a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Lee to add item number 31 to the consent calendar. Item number 31 is to consider recommendations relating to an agreement between the county and San Jose State University Research Foundation. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to add item number 32 to the consent calendar. Item number 32 is to consider recommendations relating to the hate crime task force. We have a request from President Wasserman, Supervisor Lee to add item number 33 to the consent calendar. Item number 33 is to approve memorandum of agreement with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District relating to the inspection and enforcement of the Ridge Line Protection Easement Deed dated August 18, 1972. We have a request from administration to hold item number 34 to August 31st, 2021. Item number 34 is to receive report relating to community engagement and outreach policies for housing development. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to hold item number 35 to September 14th, 2021. Item number 35 is to receive report relating to options for designating and implementing a firearm buyback program on an annual basis. We have a request from President Wasserman and Supervisor Chavez to consider item numbers 36, 37, 38, and 
126 concurrently. Item number 36 is to consider recommendations relating to the airborne lead study of Reed Hillview Airport. Item number 37 is to direct administration and county council to take all necessary actions, including a closure, to immediately prevent lead contamination from operations at Reed Hillview Airport. Item number 38 is to receive a report from the Facilities and Fleet Department and the Roads and Airports Department relating to the development of a community participation framework for collaborative and transparent stakeholder engagement regarding potential land use changes at the Reed Hillview Airport site. Item number 126 is to adopt resolution of the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara declaring its intention to maintain the existing aircraft hangar capacity and existing runway length and width at San Martin Airport. There is a correction to item number 39. The item was incorrectly placed under time certain to be heard no earlier than 6 p.m. Items removed from the consent calendar will be considering following consideration of any non-time certain items or earlier at the board's discretion. Item number 39 is to consider items previously removed from the consent calendar. There is a correction to item number 95VI. The item should read, Supervisor Simidian nominates Sherry Sager okay. for reappointment to the Santa Clara County Health Authority Governing Board of Directors, seat number 10. There is a correction to item number 105E, the item should read as follows. Approve certificates of appreciation to employee excellence award honorees for August, 2021. And pursuant to government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary adjustments that are required to be disclosed. NS-20.21 Dot zero one was approved on first reading on June 22nd, 2021, but will not be fully approved until, is, until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting. NS-20.21.01 adds back to the county's executive leadership salary ordinance, the position of director finance agency, including a 3% general wage increase to the position's prior salary range, effective August 23rd, 2021. And that concludes the consent calendar. Nancy, we're gonna give you a five minute break now while you get some water. We're gonna hear from Supervisor Chavez first, then Supervisor Ellenberg, and then we will turn to public comment um, on the consent calendar and each person will get one minute. Supervisor Chavez. Great job, Nancy. I know, and um, Supervisor Wasserman, I, I know you're admonishing us because we have such a long agenda. So I wanted to see if some, I, I don't mean this in a bad way, I just know how hard it is to manage this. So um, I wanted to make some offers that, that I hope would contribute. I'd like to add items 26 and 27 to the consent calendar. These items will allow uh, will allocate, I'm sorry, critical resources to the BASC. And I wanna thank, uh, thank, uh, thank you to the staff for moving on these items. What I'd like to do is defer item 25 to the August 31st board meeting. This is largely a report back to my referral. The staffing, and frankly, the staffing organizational chart is non-responsive uh, to my request because it's in clear, unclear and it's very difficult for me to understand who's in charge. What I then like to do is ask um, staff to come back with a clear reporting structure depicting all the positions at the VASC from all co-located departments. And secondly, for the consideration of myself and my colleagues, I'd like the staff to um, come back with two positions. One, a VASC director position to oversee all center functions and operations that would be analogous to a health center manager and two, a multimedia communications officer to manage the communications functions at the VASC. I'm asking those to come back for consideration for my colleagues, not to make a decision today. So I, I just wanna be clear about that. Thank you. So I heard that direction regarding 25 and what you wanted back and 26 and 27 be added to consent. That's correct. And then um, 
on the on the um, items uh, on the AOT items, I I um I see that we we had a request to to defer these items uh, 21 to the 31st. And what I I mean I'm sorry. What I would like to recommend is that we defer only item 21 to the 31st, and that we approve items 22 and 23 on consent today. Items 22 and 23 appropriate the funds for the program and create the positions. And this will allow Sherry and her team to move forward on the AOT implementation and start the recruiting process. The plan and process um, in item 21 is something that, you know, if we need more time to discuss, I'm fine moving this to the 31st. Uh, if so that was a hold 21 and a consent 22, 23. That's correct. And then my last uh, comment is relative to item 33. And um, on this item, I, I see also that there was a, I think it was a request to put on consent. Um, I don't know if it, stay, if it stays on consent. What I'd like um, my colleagues to consider is that we have a five-year check-in regarding the pr productivity of this agreement that would come back to the full board in that five-year time frame just to understand how it works and um, to get feedback from the staff and our partners at MidPen and Lehigh. So for clarity and Supervisor Lee, this, this uh, is a request being made of you as well because we both wanted to add 33 onto consent. I'm hearing Supervisor Chavez say she's fine with leaving it on consent, just ask for a report back in five years. Is that fine with you? Thank you, that's fine with me as, as well. Okay, Supervisor Chavez, if that's the end of yours, the next hand up was Vice President Ellen. Thanks, Chavez. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Great. Vice Thanks President so much. Ellen. Thank you. I just want to make comments on uh, two items, uh, please, not to uh, remove or add to consent, but on item 24, uh, in May, when we considered uh, Supervisor Chavez's referral on school absenteeism, I'd asked for that body of work to be considered alongside my previously approved referral to expand school-based mental health services. That was supposed to have happened. Excuse me, Vice President. You're talking yes. about item 24? I am, and I just want to make a correction to the title, which is why I'm doing it on consent, and I'm just sharing some context. Okay. I don't want to hear the item. 24 is going to be heard. It is, but for uh, but my understanding is to make a correction to the ledge file title that I should do it on consent when. Um, sure. That, that's all right. All right. I'm not going to discuss the, the the substance of the of the item at all. Um, but it was supposed to have happened at the June uh, Children, Family, and Seniors Committee. That report wasn't responsive uh, to the request to do outreach to all local school districts which resulted in our direction from CFSC that the report that's before us come today. And while the content of the report addresses both referrals, thank you to staff for that, the title of the ledge file is incomplete and it may have led some people who were interested in the school's mental health issue to overlook and not review this item. So really I'm flagging this now um, to administration that, that we'd be very careful in naming ledge files uh, in the future to be sure that they reflect the entirety of the report and the board direction. And I'll look forward to hearing the item in the uh, in the regular agenda. On item 49, I appreciate the work from HHS, ESA, and our labor partners uh, that has gone into figuring out a system to compensate our nurse examiners and other clinical staff supporting the SART team. Given all of the intricacies of the pay differentials, I'd like to get some assurance from administration that the documentation and coordination of payroll be prioritized to make sure that there are no bumps in the new system and that the issues previously raised by RNPA about inaccurate paychecks for work completed, especially during COVID, are being resolved with the addition of the new uh, ESA positions in the last budget. Thank um, you. Dr. Smith. Is, yes, thanks. Dr. Smith, if you could just confirm her request. Yes, we're doing the best we can to deal with that with the new staff. I can't uh, guarantee that no mistake will ever be made, but that's our goal. I, I understand that we can't guarantee that no mistakes will ever be made, but in addressing the, the specific issues um, that they have in front of them now, can you assure us that the addition of new staff will, um, 
will be charged with addressing those specific issues promptly. Oh, yes. So, All right. There you go. Can I ask another question? Yes. Paul, you've got me. I was confused about 24. Did that get moved to consent or you were just commenting? No, 24 is going to be heard. I but just Allenberg just wanted to make a correction the way it was listed. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Just wanted to make clear. Vice President, anything else? Vice President Ellenberg? No, nothing else. The, the title change, I, I should be more specific, should sure. be Report on Chronic Absenteeism and School-Based Mental Health Services. Great. Okay, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. You hear me okay, right? Okay. So um, thanks for uh, all those uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive changes. And uh, a few more items I want to uh, bring up and try to move forward, uh, hopefully, to save us some time. For item number 29, uh, would ask to have that defer to September 14. I'm for sorry, Supervisor Lee, you and I had that added to consent calendar. Did you now wish to defer it instead? Yes, uh, yeah, we, I reviewed it and uh, we, I, I would like to ask to get that deferred to September 14th instead. Uh, for item number 106, uh, it's currently on consent, but I would like to add with the following recommendation. I would like to request the planning department to conduct public outreach and receive feedback on a proposed ordinance change before it comes back to the board for the final reading on August 31st. I also request that the administration provide information on the type of outreach efforts that were conducted between now and the August 31st meeting. For the sake to increase awareness and transparency, I would also like to request that the planning department add a link of the proposed owner's language to its website so people could actually read it. For the item number 21 of AOT, um, I agree with deferring the item uh, 21. But I would like to request the administration do the reach out uh, outreach to the court for the AOT planning implementation process. My office was notified that the court, uh, specifically Judge Manley, has not been involved in the planning process thus far, despite the statute making it clear that there's a court procedure. We believe that for the AOT to be truly successful, the Behavior Health Service Department needs to work collaboratively and closely with the court. And I would uh, ask that to, to take place um, before this come, it should come back to us. On item number 31st, which is now currently on consent uh, based on my referral, I just want to thank staff for your hard work on this report. I look forward to collaborating with San Jose State University uh, to build community education and awareness about the rich histories of local Asian American trailblazers. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, President Wasserman. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Um, I am uh, more than good with item number 14 being moved to the consent calendar. This is the referral I submitted about booster shots. I would just like to ask uh, Supervisor Wasserman that we do that with the understanding that when we get to item 13, which is our COVID report, that we'll have some discussion about the role of booster shots uh, during that larger discussion, if that's agreeable to you, sir. Sure. Thank you. And then um, uh, we've had a, a couple of different proposals now on uh, items 21, 22, and 23, which deal with uh, AOT, assisted outpatient treatment. Um, when I saw that uh, you and Supervisor Chavez had asked that these items be held till the uh, next meeting, I thought, well, that would be good because what I would like to ensure we get when the item comes back to us is a clearer understanding, a little more discussion about the role of nonprofits versus our own county staff in delivering these services. Supervisor Lee will recall that when we had the special hearing on AOT, also known as Laura's Law, at the Health and Hospital Committee, we heard from two nonprofits who were leading the effort in uh, Alameda and San Mateo counties. Uh, and I frankly struggled a little bit with 
these items as I reviewed them to understand to what extent uh, the county staff was going to be a service provider uh, directly and to what extent we would be working with and through our community nonprofits. Uh, today, of course, just a few minutes ago, Supervisor Chavez, in an effort to make sure we move expeditiously, which I support, said, let's uh, take action on 22 and 23. And I guess the question I have for, super, uh, for uh, the CEO, if I may, through the chair is, are we committed uh, to that path if we take the action on 22 and 23? I don't want to do anything today that would preclude a wider ranging discussion and consideration of nonprofit uh, leadership on this subject. So let me go first to uh, Dr. Smith, if I may. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah, let me try to clarify. Um, the pay position changes and the uh, appropriation changes that are on the agenda for you today have to do with the implementation of the program administratively and the relationship with the courts. They do not have to do with the clinical care. The clinical care will be um, administered by contract through the CBOs and those contracts will come back to the board in the future when we've got negotiated um, augmentations of the services. So the approval of the actions today would only mean that we could move ahead with actually the administrative structure to get the program going and to begin uh, renegotiating the contracts. Uh, it doesn't provide, there's no intention for the county to actually be providing the clinical services for AOT. All right, well, if I could then indicate support for where I think this matter rested after Supervisor Chavez's request, which is that we um, hold item 21, I believe, until our next meeting, and then take action today on consent for items 22 and 23. Yes. But doing that through the chair, doing that, with uh, two caveats. One is that uh, we've been assured today by the CEO that that does not preclude fuller uh, engagement, participation, service delivery by the NGOs. And also, frankly, with the understanding that uh, just in terms of how long it really takes to ramp these things up, nothing's gonna be set in stone two weeks from now. So I, I just wanna make sure Dr. Smith and staff that no one says at any point in our next meeting, oh, we can't do that because you've already made a commitment on 22 and 23. I'm happy to get started. I'm happy to let things move forward. Don't want to delay the process, but I also don't want to be precluded or have our board precluded from making policy judgments uh, about uh, the way in which these services are delivered. Through the chair, Dr. Smith, does that work? Yes, uh, Supervisor, that does work. Um, Thank you. Well, I have the floor. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Mr. President? Yes. Not, not related to this issue, but a previous one by Supervisor Lee. Yes. Um, I think regarding 106, which is the planning issue uh, regarding the fire ordinance change, um, staff heard different things. So I just want to clarify um, what I understood was we're gonna move ahead with reading the first reading of the ordinance and do outreach, but no change in the ordinance is anticipated in the future. Supervisor Lee. Correct, there's no change uh, unless there's a significant uh, uh, input from the outreach that might change it. And again, we'll read it again August 31st if there's an issue that, that will be aired out at that time. So there'll still be opportunity for people who want to make change. Between okay, I just, then, there should be no change. Thank you. Just wanted to be clear. Sorry okay. to interrupt. No problem. Thank you. And Supervisor Wasserman, through the chair again, if I may, the final clarification I wanted to request on item 21, 22, 23 is that when staff comes back to us with uh, this item in two weeks, or at least item 21, that we do in fact get a more um, fulsome description uh, from the staff about. Uh, who actually provides the services. And I think this is consistent with Supervisor Chavez's request because the piece that she uh, suggested that we do hold on to was the, the plan. 
and I think clearly the role of our community-based nonprofits is going to be uh, a part of the plan. So with that understanding, I will say thank you. I do not believe I have any other comments, questions, or concerns at the moment uh, on our uh, various changes to the consent calendar. Thank you. you. You reserve the right to do so in the future, I understand. So with that, Nancy, let's turn to our seven members we have for speaking. They get one minute each. Our first speaker is Erica Guetta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, uh, supervisors. Um, thank you for um, your comments uh, in this session about um, leaving on consent item number 33. Um, however, I would not be doing my job if um, on behalf of Lehigh, I respectfully request that the board um, defers the item. Um, Lehigh uh, has not had the opportunity to review the proposed memorandum of the agreement in detail. And um, we believe that additional time for study is appropriate considering the unique nature of this proposal and because there is no immediate change proposed for the reach line that requires urgent action, urgent action on this matter. Um, I also want to note that there is no staff uh, memoranda that describes the legal basis for the delegation of authority. And um, we will we look forward to working with all of you, uh, so as county staff, um, on this matter. Thanks again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barton Henchman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Good morning, President Wasserman, members of the board. Bart Heckman, uh, I'm a land use attorney here in Santa Clara, but I'm speaking uh, as an individual resident of the county regarding consent item 106, which is your new appeal process for the uh, CAL FIRE conditions. While I agree that we need to get an appeal process in place, uh, I think that the ordinance that is before you today uh, takes the, the exact same people who made the decision, who participated in the decision to impose a condition and places them as the decision makers on the appeal. So if you're looking to design a, a rubber stamp appeal, I think this is effective. But if you are looking for an independent uh, decision maker, then I think in both instances, you need to replace uh, those uh, uh, fire staff with an, uh, a non-county employee with expertise in fire protection regulation and a further appeal to the board, I think, would be desirable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tessa Woodman-Seep. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute, and you will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. This is Tessa woodman C. I I am a uh, master's in mass communication and education, and my husband is a master's in biology. And we homeschooled our children. And my son, Marshall woodman C., who ran for city council, said that, if we solve the climate crisis, we will solve all our problems. And we need to focus only on our climate crisis. And that is why I am talking today about uh, public health and the issues that were on the children's health. Many children are dying of COVID fr and from um, you know, COVID. So, so basically we have to change. And the way we need to change is we need to stay home. It was the lesson that we learned from COVID is to stay home. It's the lesson we need to do for climate crisis. And we need to keep the virtualization of our, our government meetings. We need to keep the virtualization of our schools, our virtualization of our workplaces as much as we can, because we, the, the, we cannot um, externalize the pollution costs of going to meetings, of going places. We need to stay home and grow food. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, this is like a practice of insanity and I define insanity as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I can't believe that Supervisor Chavez still wants to go forward with this AOT. Considering what happened, you, the board cannot take a moral position on what Things is going to in our jails. Bad to worse. Yes. Can I not be interrupted? Yes, that was a technical issue. Your time has stopped. Go right ahead, Paul. Okay, thank you. It, the, to, for this board to try to take a moral position on what has been happening in these years, I have been warning this board. 
I have to, I have to go. I have to get therapy because of the PTSD I experienced in those jails and prisons, especially this one. I experienced D team. I know everything there is to know about D team. And you're still going to go forward with this AOT. I am requesting formally that the AOT be terminated indefinitely until that jail is responsible for our lives. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, to speak on, uh, I think it's about items 33 and 34 about uh, Mid Peninsula uh, Open Space District and uh, issues of um, uh, housing and, and community services. Uh, to again offer, you know, I, I need to thank yourselves for, I think, what's been incredible work on your part to prepare the community for what can be possible upcoming natural disasters uh, in the Bay Area of earthquake, wildfire, and sea level rise. And I, I just hope we can all develop how to more openly talk about this issue. And what I'm learning to say is how to consider mitigating the ideas of uh, its disaster capitalism ideas as well. Um, for the uh, other item about housing issues, uh, a very much of a thank you to Jethro Moore and his words of how do we talk about ELI, VLI, and mixed income with the west side of Santa Clara Valley and, and what can be their, their role. It was really nice words to hear from Dr. Moore. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Maddox. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, my name is Paula Maddox and I work for the county. I do not agree with the vaccine mandates. Um, it is despicable for a business or government agency to force someone to take a shot that is unproven, dangerous, and not fully tested. The motivation is clearly self-serving and demonstrates a desperate attempt by incompetent officials to dodge culpability for mishandling this pandemic. Let those who wanna take the shot do so, and let those who do not have an option to have a waiver that the county will not be financially or civilly liable for any issues that maybe these employees have regarding COVID. Please consider this so that we employees do not lose our jobs and continue to flourish and help the community as some of us have been doing for so many years. Thank you and God bless. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the, the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Thank you, everyone. Scott Largent. It really just seems like the public needs more time to be able to uh, discuss these items that are on the consent calendar. Um, I was originally going to talk about item number 87 in, in regards to abode services, um, but getting all this out uh, now, this is important information. It's lived experience, but it's difficult to do in one minute. And it seems like you guys might want to think about maybe breaking these meetings up. Everybody's following the rules on the public side, but I'm kind of, you guys are no longer doing that. Um, I don't think it was intentional, Mike, to give one minute. Normally, you are very good about allowing the proper time based upon what it says on the agenda. You're very good about following the Brown Act. Supervisor Chavez, you're really not good at doing that. 30 seconds to a minute on items that should have had three minutes when nobody shows up. The public needs the right to speak and you guys need to make that happen. This is not right, thank you. Our next speaker is Zachary Bodecker. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, good morning. Thank you. This is the first time I've ever been to one of these council meetings. I've lived in the Hillview, San Jose uh, area for about 25 years now in the same home. Um, my item would be agenda number 38, number 12. I think it would be a good idea to turn the Reed Hillview Airport into a cultural center, maybe also a museum. We could use electric vehicles as now electric planes are being created right now, and that could help further uh, inspire the younger students in the area to develop in STEAM. We could put solar panels or expand the solar farm and put solar on top of the roofs, uh, remodel the business center, or possibly add either a county medical clinic or low-income housing. Um, keep a portion of the uh, airport available for wildfire staging, specifically for helicopters, where we could have the helicopters land and refuel. 
and then extend uh, Adrian Way so that the fire trucks can access the location from both Capital Expressway, Story, Tully, and Adrian. Thank you for uh, your consent. Thank you, Zachary. And just a reminder, this is for consent items today. The um, lead study, uh, Drs. Ron's study, et cetera, will be heard at six o'clock uh, this evening. Go ahead, Nancy. Our next speaker is Aaron. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. And you will have one minute to speak. Uh, my name is Aaron Noriega. I'm a county employee. I've been with the county for 23 years. And I'm, I'm calling in to discuss and uh, protest the mandates mandates for masks, mandates for the shots, mandates for testing. The data has been proven. The CDC has admitted the PCR tests do not distinguish between COVID, the flu, and the cold, yet you're mandating these tests. The WHO admitted that uh, asymptomatic people do not spread the virus. They rarely do, if ever, okay? You guys wanna impose these mandates on people and you put in your language that these shots are uh, tested and are safe, yet there's been no long-term study to back up that data. And you ignore the data on the VAR site that reports 12,000 people have died from the shots and that is underreported. So I'm here to say that there should be no mandates at all period. And if you read the back of the, the box on the mass, it will tell you that the, the, the mass do not protect against any virus or bacteria. Thank you. Our next speaker is Helio Carlos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Carlos, you may begin. Carlos seems to be having some technical difficulties. I will come back to him. Thank you. Jessica, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. And you have one minute to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Jessica Campos and I've been working for the county for 16 years. As the Board of Supervisors, you took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. You took an oath to protect our rights as citizens. You have to ask yourself, is it ethically right to mandate or force a substance injected into our bodies, not knowing how it will affect each individual or the long-term effects? This vaccine is not FDA approved or has not undergone enough clinical trials. A mandate is a violation of a constitutional right. It's my body, my choice. Do you have the right to tell me I must abort a child or not? It's the same concept. This is a exam great example of the quid pro quo. The vac if I do not get the vaccine, I then lose my job. A career we all worked hard for pursuing an education and being law abiding citizens. You are interfering with how we feed our children, how we pay our, our expenses, our medical, our mortgages. Where has the morale gone? Can you ask yourself that? Can you sleep at night knowing that all these mandates are unconstitutional? I personally have two people. Our next speaker is Helio Carlos. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, supervisors. Um, I just wanted to um, let you guys know that I recently got vaccinated, not by due to the mandate they were going to have recently. It was more by choice. Um, I do ask that you take into consideration that this should be up to every individual's choice. It should not be mandated. Um, when I was hired 17 years ago with the county, I was offered the hepatitis B vaccination. If I chose not to, we had to fill out a waiver indicating that the county was not liable. I believe that that should be the same thing given to our current employees. Uh, I implore you that this is a slippery slope and not all of us are conspiracy theorists, right wing coops, you know, so I really, really ask that you take this into consideration and give us an opportunity to, to the individuals who choose not to be vaccinated to have a waiver in place. Thank you so much and have a good day. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you very much, Nancy. Appreciate that. Nancy, what I'm going to do is just go down through the numbers on our consent calendar. I'm going to assume all the various comments that were made, suggestions that we nodded to and agreed to, et cetera. They're all in the public record. And I thank you and all those that uh, handle those afterwards to make sure they're picked up accurately. We handled 5A and 5C earlier when we were talking about commendations. 
And uh, way to go, Atticus, on that uh, Eagle Scout. Congratulations, young man. Um, what I'm going to do now is go through this consent calendar, and then I'll look for a motion to approve what I've said. Going in numerical order, we have oops, let me get to 14. All right, 14 is on consent, 15 consent, 16 consent, 17 consent, 18 consent, 21 is being held, 22 consent, 23 consent, 25 is being held, 26 consent, 27 consent, 29 is being held, 30 consent, 31 consent, 32 consent, 33 consent, 34 is being held, 35 is being held. Nancy, does that agree with you? Yes. Thank you very much. Supervisors, any additional comments? Otherwise, I'll look for a motion. So moved with all comments made by the board. Thank Second. you very much. Oh, quick question. Second by Vice President Ellenberg and a question by Supervisor Lee. Supervisor? Apologies. I, I think you just went through everything before the 6 p.m. hearing, right? That's all you're covering. You're not, you are not. haven't talked about combining the 36, 37, 38, 39, oh, yeah, and, and 126. Yeah, I thought we would hear those. Together, right? Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you. And then that's all. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, most, yeah, I'm not even going to go there. Okay. <laughs> so the chair, oh. There were also corrections noted for 39, 95BI, and 105E. Thank you so, very much, Nancy. Yeah, the motion would include all corrections from staff, all comments from the board, and all um, joint hearings as well. Yes. Items. Yeah. yes, and we're glad you, Nancy, and company are going back to look up what each of those are. Supervisor Ellenberg, you seconded the uh, motion by Chavez? I sure did. Thank, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, roll call vote, please, Nancy. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Yes. <clears throat> Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. And, and President Wasserman, my apologies for uh, Mike talk when I was trying to get my email fixed earlier today. So just I, I didn't want anyone to think that the comment applied to anything that was being said or done. It was uh, a tech problem going from bad to worse. So again, my apologies. Thank you. We, we've all done that. Thank you very much. All right. Now we move on. Now we move on to item number 38 which is a public hearing to be heard no sooner than 10 a.m. We've certainly met that qualification. Uh, regarding the purchase of real property located at 2001, the Alameda. And let me flip my binder over to item number eight. And I'm gonna guess it's the tremendous Consuelo that's gonna make a brief staff presentation. Thank you, Board President Wasserman and members of the board. Consuelo Hernandez, Director, Office of Supportive Housing. Nothing too much to add here, Supervisor, from the staff report. We are working with the partnership on the community engagement strategy to make sure that uh, we are following this uh, potential development um, in the early stages. Thank you very much. Nancy, it looks like we have one public speaker. Four public speakers. We have four public speakers. On this side. Yes. Wonderful. Will you please give them a minute each? Yes. One moment while we get our timer up. And then we'll turn to Vice President Ellenberg. Paul Soto, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I, I've been trying to center redlining policies and to have an open discussion about the redlining that has occurred here in this city, in this county. Okay, because these land use uh, proposals, the redlining that has happened and really centering equity, really exactly what that means and what 
inequities that people like me have experienced over the past 100 years in this city. That's how long my family's been, 100 years. Okay, and we have not had an open discussion on a county level with respect to the redlining and its generational impacts economically, socially, politically, and existentially. And until we do, you're making all of these decisions and you're putting them on top of these issues that we talk about equity, but we really don't get at the root of the problem. And the root of the inequities is the redlining policies. We need to start talking about that. Our next speaker is David Minetta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you good, begin speaking. Good morning. Um, good morning. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, Super, Supervisor Wasserman, uh, Supervisor of County Administration, thanks for the opportunity to speak at this hearing regarding the sale of 2001, the Alameda. Momentum for Health has owned this property for decades and it was a difficult decision for us to sell the property. We served thousands of our neighbors and other community members needing behavioral health services from this site. The, moment, the Momentum Board chose this group over other private for-profit parties because of the strong reputation of the agencies involved and the generational opportunities they bring to the table. Just as this was our board's moment to decide for the greater good and to sell our property to this talented and can-do group, so too it is it this board's opportunity to ensure that generations of our neighbors have affordable housing and essential services, especially our black neighbors. Of note, I think it's not an accident that, that today this board recognized our community's own Reverend Moore for racial justice and equity. Please continue his work through this project. Our next speaker is Walter Wilson. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning, board, President Wasserman. Um, I wanna thank uh, Consuelo and her office uh, for doing the work that they're doing to advance this project. I am the project manager for the African-American Cultural Center project that um, Dave Mineta just spoke about. And we're looking forward to a really strong partnership with uh, First Community Housing as uh, we move forward and try to um, advance this project into a um, iconic project on behalf of the uh, African African ancestry community here. And, um, you know, working with the Office of Supportive Housing has been, um, uh, has made it so, um, so easy and seamless to do this. And I wanna thank the board for their support as well. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. All right, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. I used to live uh, right in the very area that uh, this project is in. Uh, it sounds interesting. There's a African health clinic uh, uh, a few blocks away uh, in the area. Um, I, I, I apologize, I may have said uh, in my previous public comment, uh, the words Jeffrey Moore instead of Jethro Moore. And I'm sorry about that, uh, Dr. Jeff, Jethro Moore. Um, with 34 seconds, um, I just, hopefully I can uh, use my public comment time to, to offer the reminders that uh, ELI, VLI, mixed income housing ideas are really being set up at the MTC level, level and CASA level. Uh, at this time, they're technically supposed to be getting in full gear by say 2029. But I think if we start those good practices now, by 2025, we'll be really well prepared. And that's what we need to be doing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose Lujano. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Good morning, board. This is Regina Celestine Williams. I'm here with Jose. And we both work at First Community Housing. I'm the Director of Housing Development, and he is the project manager for this project. We are thrilled at the partnership with the county in this development. Um, we feel like we're going to have an excellent opportunity to work with the community to meet the needs of our BIPOC community, as well as work towards um, racial justice in an actual development that can heal um, some of the past uh, structural elements that have created division in our community. And we're looking forward to doing that through development, through um, conversation um, and through partnership. And so we, we just wanna thank you today for considering this item 
as we move forward um, in healing. All right. Our next speaker is Tessa Woodman Seep. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. The timer will start yes, when you begin speaking. Okay, great. Tessa Woodman C. And the thing is that, first of all, I don't even know where this project is. We always talk about community outreach. You don't even make it clear where it is and what it is. So that's a problem. And that's where like Greta Thunberg says, we it's all a lot of BS, you know, we're actors. She says we're actors in terms of environmental. We're actors in terms of equity. And what my husband was just saying today, he is so concerned about what's going forward in terms of our climate crisis that, you know, he says we have to get back to basics. And, and what that means is that we, first of all, we can't be building high because that takes cement. Cement, if it was a country, would be the third largest producer of CO2, that's a greenhouse gas. So we have to get back to basics, back to, you know, growing food on the ground, you know, these are the things that we need to be focusing on, climate crisis, and, and we're not. And, and the equity is providing food so we don't become cannibals. That is the issue that we need to be facing. And all is development. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you. I obviously opened the public hearing and now I'm going to close the public hearing. And I'm gonna to turn to Vice President Ellenberg and then Supervisor Lee for comments. And then a vote, please. A motion, please. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to uh, make a motion for approval. I want to thank staff for bringing the item to the board. I'm really glad to support this today, both today and as the project moves forward through the, the process. Our community has told us that our greatest collective need is to create more affordable and supportive housing and acquiring locations like this will help us get there. I'm particularly glad the county is working with First, First Community Housing, the African-American community, and Momentum for Mental Health. And I wanna make sure that we also connect with my district's neighborhood leaders, stakeholders, and neighborhoods uh, during the community engagement effort. Uh, and also noting that this location is really on the, on the border of, of D4 on uh, what I'll call my side of the Alameda. Uh, Supervisor Chavez's district is on the other side. Um, so Supervisor Chavez, I'd like to just formally extend an invitation to you to join me in holding uh, joint community meetings as the project uh, progresses. Uh, progresses. Uh, my residents have made it clear that community meetings ensure a transparent and productive process. And I, my thought is that perhaps joint community meetings would be a good way to ensure transparency for both of our neighborhoods along the Alameda as we move along with the process. And glad to continue this offline uh, since I know that we have a long meeting ahead of us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank Supervisor you for happiness about this issue. Supervisor Lee. Yes, and I would like to go ahead and second uh, my colleague's uh, uh, excellent motion. Uh, the <clears throat> the locations right off of the 880 uh, exit uh, in, in Alameda is a very, very great location. First of all, I would like to thank the board for the momentum for uh, mental health, for the board for not taking basically the highest bidder, but really think about the consideration of the community. And that's really unusual and really thoughtful of you. So I want to thank uh, Dave Mineta and your team for doing that and working with such a great group like First Community Housing to, to, to make this work. And also the African American Cultural Center uh, with Mr. Wilson's comments, uh, I can't think of a better tenant and better uh, uh, leader to, to bring this project to fruition. Uh, uh, the affordable housing need of a county cannot be understated. And so I really look forward to a great project over there. I'm looking forward to something of a high density. It's a great location for commuting. Uh, and I really hope that this will be a very exciting, successful project to come. And thank you for your uh, your good work. Thanks. Good enough. Everybody in support. We've got a motion. We've got a second. Any other discussion? Hearing and seeing none. Nancy, please take a vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously. And I think what makes sense for us, and just to give a little heads up to staff, is that we handle 9, 10, and 11, then break for lunch for 30 minutes, and then come back to start with 12. Is that all right with everybody? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, that sounds good then. We now move on to the aforementioned item number nine, approving a resolution. And I am gonna open the public hearing and receive testimony. Consuelo. Thank you, Board President Wasserman. Nothing to add at this time. Thank you. We have three speakers. Nancy, if you would invite them. Sure. One minute. Yes, please. Okay. Tessa Woodmanseep, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Okay. Well, you don't really um, make it clear what this item is about. It's, it's really good to put these items on the screen like the City Council of San Jose does so we know what we're talking about. But like I said in my prior comments, the only thing we're supposed to be talking about is our climate crisis. So I will take that opportunity. And so basically the issues are that we have to degrow. That's one of the issues. We have to degrow and we have to get back to basics. And that, that's what the science is saying we need to do. And we need to do it very quickly. And so that, that's where we have to start. You know, transformational change is what the science is calling for. And so that is getting back to basics, food, clothing, and shelter. And you know, shelter can be minimized. You know, we could really, you know, intensify where we live in, you know, in the land. And we need to use all of our land productively to grow food, all of it. Because we have also, besides the climate crisis, we have an ecological collapse and we're losing the pollinators. And this is what we need to be addressing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute. The infrastructure that, uh, the infrastructure to support the amounts of people that are going to be, because this county and city is gonna to try to arrest its way out of uh, out of their 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 responsibility for the poverty that's being created. Okay, that's why Gary Dillabo and all these developers got with Corrales and Camus and lobbied this county in order to pass that AOT. Because what they're going to do is they don't want to accept the moral responsibility for the poverty that they've created. Because when you put that kind of pressure on a human mind and a psyche and, and, and their entire existential uh, uh, relationship to the world, that in itself is gonna create a mental health issue. I guarantee it, okay? And so what is happening here is that you don't have the infrastructure to support that. When those people get released back out into the community, where are they gonna go? This is a good, responsible way by which to uh, preserve these types of homes and these types of uh, properties, but you're going to need a lot more. Do you know out of a county of 2 million people, approximately, mas o menos, that we only have 10 detox beds. And those 10 detox beds have existed for over 30 years. 10 detox beds. That's why you have a lot of homeless people out on the streets because you don't have the infrastructure in order to support recovery. And the fact that you guys let uh, 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 Judge Manley, out of these conversations, shows a. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute, and you have one minute to speak. Hi, thank you. To note, Tessa's phone sounding a little muffled, as she can hear this right now. Um, and to comment on Paul Soto's words uh, as well, um, what I've been trying to say uh, recently, we really have to learn how to be open to a lot of new large subsidy programs that are coming down the pipe from the federal and state level. There's new programs coming to the Bay Area that really are attempting, that will attempt to address the future of how homeless transitional housing can be converted into uh, permanent housing with the use of these massive new subsidy programs. Uh, it's a game changer. And we have to be you know, responsible at this time in, in what these practices can do and not, and not create a subsidy process that is simply gonna fuel the real estate industry. Um, we're really at a precipice, or not a precipice, we're at a new beginning of how to talk about the future of, of transitional housing to permanent housing for people. Um, let's learn to talk about this openly and constructively. Let's make it a shared process and not a fearful uh, Victorian manners process, um, and a, a process of politely and secrecy. Uh, please, please be talking about these things often with the public uh, as, as, as this is what will be happening in our future in the next five to 10 years. 
Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you, Nancy. Since we've heard from the public, I'll now close the public hearing. Look to my supervisors for a motion regarding adopting a resolution and approving delegation of authority. Supervisor Chavez. So moved. Thank you. Motion by Supervisor Chavez, a second by Supervisor Lee. Any further discussion? Oops, Supervisor Chavez, do you have more to add? Thank you. Uh, Consuela will know I'm always going to say make, make sure we maintain ownership long term. Thank you. She's got it. Okay, with that, Nancy, I will ask you to call for a vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Aye. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously. We now move on to. Sorry. So Sorry, Board President Wasserman. I believe um, the public hearing needs to be closed. Oh, I thought I did do that. Sorry. Okay, we we opened it, we heard from the public, then we closed it, then we had a motion and a second, and we voted on it unanimously. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number 10, which is also a public hearing regarding the purchase of real property for public park for public park purposes as part of Calero County Park. That's the assessor's parcel number 708-333-008. And I will now open the public hearing and receive testimony. Take it away, Nancy. We have three speakers. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the primary ways in which redlining uh, impacted the community was uh, park allocation. Okay, the PRNS department was the was the arm by which land uses were. Uh, that that's why you have like, uh, you know, you don't have no trees, you don't have no parks, you don't have nothing like that. Open spaces. You didn't have any community centers on the east side, you know, of, of, of King Road. I know because my father grew up there in Sasquatch. So he t he tells me everything, and he's going to be at that meeting tonight. You guys want to hear some testimony about the history of that airport? He's going to be there tonight. So the what has happened in the city is you have, when you look at the west side, you can tell exactly where all the resources went. You know exactly where all this money went, okay? And so we need to talk about that, that right there, because it's disgusting to continue to talk about equity and not talk about the redlining policies the way it manifested through the PRNS departments. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for this project and this item. Um, to just try to again uh, quickly offer, I mean, uh, we, we're at such a point, uh, you know, such a new beginning with the ideas of uh, subsidy programs and the large amount of money that, uh, uh, that is coming through from the federal and state level. I, you really have to make an effort to be to be open with the public about the new subsidy process that is happening. Um, and, and it isn't a matter of, of trying to continue our previous practices of life before COVID-19, although I understand we all want to do that, but we're just, we're in a new era now. And we have to learn to be honest with each other and, and, and open and, and, and constructive. Learn how to be, I mean, these are, it's really practical to be talking about these projects with the community and yet you really don't want to and i know you don't so learn how to please do this thank you our next speaker is tessa woodmansey i am unmuting you please accept the unmute and you have one minute to speak yes thank you tessa woodmansey thank you for talking about parks because that's what we really need to talk about is growing food and that can happen even in our parks and the base, you know, husband and I were just talking that when our basic needs are not met, you know, it's very hard to deal with the higher, you know, the hierarchy of needs. And so we need to have our basic needs met. And we saw with COVID that there were all around our country, uh, there were lines of people waiting in, in fossil fuel cars, idling to get food. So we need to create food um, uh, uh, to, to meet the, the basic needs. So we're not under an, ex you know, an existential threat, which we all are. I mean, that's what it is. That's what climate change is, an existential threat, threat, meaning our survival. And we, you know, the most loving thing we can do is to provide food for people. And so this is what we need to be doing locally 
and it is a real salve to, to the mass migration, the dislocation, the massive dislocation to provide food that we would have that here. And they are coming here, so we have to get ready. And that concludes the public comment. Thank you. With the conclusion of public comment, I will now close the public hearing and look for a motion or discussion. Approval. So we have motion for approval to adopt the resolution and approve the request for appropriate modifications. Do we have a second, Supervisor Chavez's second. motion? Second, I believe, with Supervisor Lee. Yes? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comments? Mr. Rocha, do you have any comments to add? Or are you good? I'm good. Thank you, President Wasserman. Wonderful. Nancy, if you'll please call a vote on item number 10. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to item number 11, which is also a public hearing, exchange of real property located in the city of San Jose, Assessor, Assessor's Parcel number 72508003. I am now opening the public hearing and receiving testimony on this item. Nancy. One moment while we get our timer on the screen. Our first speaker is Tessa Woodmanseep. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute. Oh, okay. Thank you, Tessa Woodmanseep. Well, it's not very clear what property it is in San Jose, but I was talking to Paul Soto last night and he was telling me about the property across from Whole Foods, which is a um, car wash. And there's big plans among the city. Everybody's, you know, uh, groveling to get the money and the, all the money that's going to come in. And what the real issue is, when we have open space, what the science really says we need to do when we have open space is to grow food. And so that is the easiest thing to do. And that, that car wash is just a big parking lot. And it is the old. It's what, you know, we need to get rid of the old. This is the, the um, on Stockton Avenue is the great gateway to the Google Village. It needs to show the best of mankind what we have done and get rid of all fossil fuel infrastructure. And even the, the buildings that we build need to be you know small because we're not going to use cement and we have to you know most probably we can do three stories and we don't need office buildings that's the issue we don't need office buildings or retail we need housing the next speaker is paul soto i am unmuting you please accept the unmute and you have one minute uh paul soto from the horseshoe the reason why there's such a proliferation of these uh high density housing developments that are going on downtown that uh, uh councilman Perales has just basically just opened the floodgates and just welcomed them uh, all in. Dillabo, Ariaga, Eric Hayden, you know, all that crew is because 400,000 people, okay, try, try to envision this. 400,000 people are planned already right now to come into San Jose by 2035. This is fact. It's already public record. This is fact. Okay, so with that said, how many people do you think that they need to squeeze out of here? And how many people of those people that they're going to squeeze out of here, which in my estimation is 200,000 people, how many of those are descendants of Sasipuedes? How many of those people were deprived of the ability to have stability here in the city that their ancestors built with their bodies and the pesticides that were sprayed on them from Hillview Airport? Our next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to quickly try once again, <laughs> you know, to practice uh, how to speak in public, um, I hope you can really be considering uh, the importance of subsidies at this time and how it can be a practical and constructive process to explain to everyday community and share a new process we are all going through together on this. There is large amounts of money. We should all be talking about these things openly instead of trying to continue you know, practices of previous decades that uh, were respectable for their time, but it's time that we begin to open up a little more and how to be more honest with each other and uh, that will bring, I think, uh, just a better thinking all around. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment.
Thank you. With the conclusion of public comment, I close the public hearing. So we'll move and approval sure. of the staff's recommendation. Thank you. We have a motion by Supervisor Chavez and a second by Vice President Ellenberg. And I don't see Mr. Roach's hand up or any other supervisors. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Was that to make oh. the motion? Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Then I would ask Nancy to call for the vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Westerman. Yes, as well. And with that, we are going to adjourn for 30 minutes. Um, how close to 12 o'clock? We're close to 12 o'clock. We'll adjourn to 1230 and resume this meeting with item number 12. See you all in 27 minutes. Thank you. Recording stopped.